once more to our continuing series of interviews, Institute Encounters. Um, each time the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization sponsors a speaker, we have an opportunity to sit down with them and probe a little more deeply and widely about their uh, scholarship uh, interests uh, and, uh, and beliefs. Today we're very privileged to have David Bradshaw, who is Professor of Philosophy and Director of Graduate Studies at the University of Kentucky. Professor Bradshaw has an interest in the way in which Greek philosophy and Aristotle uh, shaped the modern world and shaped the modern world through its transmission in Christendom both East and West. So he has a kind of unusual um, interest uh, in comparative medieval philosophical studies. Um, reflected in his book, Aristotle, East and West. So we're going to explore that subject today. Uh, and just to begin, how did you get interested uh, in this part of the story of philosophy? Well, it goes way back. Uh, I was a physics major. I think I mentioned that to you. And so I knew the, uh, the role of the concept of energy, of course, in modern physics. Um, uh, when I was an undergraduate, I also, though, converted to Eastern Orthodoxy. And so, uh, in Eastern Orthodox theology, the term energy appears in a very different way. People talk about the divine energies uh, to uh, come to know God directly through uh, prayer and through obedience and so forth. They uh, is a way of participating in the divine energy, is how they put it. And I was puzzled by that because it was so different from the physical meaning of energy. And uh, it got me curious as to that Greek term that they're using, the Greek word is energia, it's the source of our word energy. Uh, about that time I also took a course on Aristotle's metaphysics, and what I learned there was that in Aristotle, Aristotle actually coined that word, energia, but in Aristotle it's usually not translated as energy, it's translated either as activity or actuality. And so then the question became, how did it get from what it meant in Aristotle, who coined the word, uh, to take on this further meaning of energy, which itself has both a theological usage and a physical, scientific usage. And so the whole history of that uh, intrigued me, and I found that really no one had, had looked into that before. And, um, you know, it, it, in part it left me in doubt. Well, is it correct to translate it as energy? Is that perhaps reading into it something that isn't intended by the Greek authors? Uh, and so it was partly also sort of a theological exploration is this way of understanding that term even correct. And it led me into, the, into trying to trace the history of the term and how it was understood all the way from Aristotle through Neoplatonism, people like Plotinus, uh, into uh, the early church fathers, both in the West, people like Augustine and Boethius, as well as the East. Uh, you know, which also then gets you into the linguistic differences, what happens as this word is translated into Latin. So it becomes a pretty complex enterprise, but that's, that's what got me into it. So there's a, a kind of divergence between mm -hmm. the reception of Aristotle in the West, in the Latin-speaking West, and in the Greek-speaking East. And this continues pretty much throughout the history of, of Eastern and Western Europe. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the, apart from uh, the, and, and you certainly can expand on that, but apart from the, the way in which they uh, understood the word that's translated as mm -hmm. energy, um, what were the other principal differences between the two philosophic traditions? Well, it, it, uh, it goes very, very deep, I think. Uh, and a lot of this is, is historical and linguistic. Uh, a lot of it goes back to the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. Um, of course, not only dated at 476, uh, but in reality, already before that, people in the West were no longer learning to speak and read Greek, and people in the East were no longer learning to speak and read Latin. So really by the late 4th century, you have different ecclesiastical cultures growing up that aren't speaking each other's language very well. Uh, and Augustine is a good example of this. You know, He's the preeminent figure of Latin theology at that time, didn't read Greek. Uh, and it's really astounding when you consider how much, you know, the Greek had been the predominant language of Christian thought. Uh, going back to the New Testament, the early fathers all wrote in Greek. And so in, Augustine, in some ways Augustine was sort of starting over 
and creating a system uh, uh, with its own tendency and its own sort of assumptions built into it. And what I argue in the book is that uh, when you read Augustine's Confessions, uh, it's incredibly illuminating because he tells us what his pre philosophical uh, formation was and what led him to his particular way of thinking about Christianity and about God. Uh, he was a Manichaean. He, uh, Manichaeans believed in God in some sense, but they thought of God as sort of a material entity present throughout the world, and they thought of evil as also a material entity, also present in various forms within the world. So they were materialists. And uh, for Augustine, it was a real breakthrough to read works by Plotinus and the Neoplatonists uh, that made him realize, well, wait a minute, um, reality doesn't have to only be material. And in fact, what he describes in Book 7 of the Confessions, uh, he says, it dawned upon me as I read these books that truth itself isn't in a place or a time. If a statement is true of a proposition, it simply is true. And truth is something that is not material. When you, when you say 2 plus 2 equals 4, you're not saying only here, only now. That's simply a, a truth that has no location or, or time. Well, so what that led him to, and this is, you know, in Book 7 of the Confessions, and I sort of explicated it when I deal with Augustine. What that led him to was a way of thinking about God as truth, which is a reality that is immaterial, always the same, uh, has no parts, neither spatial parts nor temporal parts. Uh, and in fact, in the case of God, what the conclusion he drew was that there's not even a distinction between God's essence and any of his attributes, such as power, or wisdom, uh, or will, or goodness. Um, this is what's called the doctrine of divine simplicity that became a, a cornerstone of all Western scholastic thought. Sounds platonic. It is platonic. It's actually even Aristotelian, because there's a lot of Aristotle woven into mm -hmm. In Neoplatonism, at least. Um, and so it, the roots of it go, go back, but Augustine gives it a particular form, which is to identify the divine essence with that and that means. And that became uh, foundational for Western theology. Um, well, if you think about that for a minute, it does uh, l create some limitations and some ways in which sort of the interaction or the penetration of God within creation uh, has to be conceived in, in certain ways and not in certain other ways. Uh, the, because what this ends up meaning is that, uh, the way Aquinas summarized it at one point, um, everything other than, everything that is not created is the divine essence. Uh, or every, everything, that is, everything is either the divine essence or a creature. Because the divine essence is simply, all, if you will, all that there is to God. The attributes, they're all simply equivalent to the divine essence. Everything else is a creature. Uh, well, then what is grace? What is the active presence of God within creatures? How do we conceive of that? And this is where that word energia becomes really crucial. Uh, that's a word that actually is used by St. Paul in the New Testament. Uh, Paul talks about the energia, the activity uh, of God. That is uh, energumene, he uses the verb in the passive to say it's being realized, it's being made active within him, within Paul. Uh, Colossians 1.29, it's a very interesting statement there. Well, um, on the view of divine simplicity that Augustine articulated, um, that activity cannot be, in any literal sense, God. That cannot be, because if it were be the divine, divine essence, and the divine essence is not realized, or uh, act activated or actualized within creatures. Well, how can you have an incarnation in that case? Well, uh, that's, I think, a real question. I mean, the incarnation raises, of course, a lot of questions, uh, but that would be one of them. Um, well, so part of what's going on here is that when Augustine reads the New Testament, he's reading it in Latin. In Latin, that word in Arabic was translated as operatio, operation. Uh, which is sort of something that's some removed from the agent. There's what I am, and then there's what I do, and they're separate and they're distinct. And I could have a different operation and yet be the same person. My essence would be unchanged. 
So he's thinking of it in that way. He's thinking of the operation simply as what God does. But in the Greek, the word energia actually meant more than that. It meant, I would argue, uh, actually meant energy. It meant something, a sort of an active living presence that is being realized and made effective. Um, and so what happens is, as the East and the West each sort of go down their own path and their own separate evolution, um, you get different ways of thinking about what grace is and how God is actively present and how God can be known. Um, the West, uh, as I would see it, tends toward a more uh, scholastic approach that develops a sort of a natural theology, as Augustine himself had already done in part, thinking about God as, uh, in turn, you know, using different philosophical resources, some of them Arist Aristotelian, Platonic, and other. Uh, you get the five ways in Aquinas, the five ways of demonstrating the existence of God. And then building on that, everything we can know about God based on natural reason. Um, and it becomes a pretty elaborate enterprise. Um, but there's a sort of a bifurcation between what you can know through natural reason and then what you can only know through revelation. Um, and in the East, uh, the Byzantine world, you know, that, that's still speaking Greek and is more sort of in continuity with those ancient sources, uh, they never divided things in that way because the interesting thing in, in, in Greek thought, reason is already a form of revelation. Uh, we, we were talking about this at breakfast. Right? In the beginning was the logos, uh, the word, the reason, the divine reason. And the logos was with God and the logos was God. Uh, and yet the logos became incarnate. So reason itself is already, uh, the reason that we have is already a way we have of sort of sharing in the divine life. And they thought more in those terms, and they developed that concept of energia uh, into a, a sort of a, a view of what's called synergy. Synergy is simply an act of cooperation with another, right? A sharing of energia, syn synergy. Um, well, uh, synergy between uh, a human being and God is, is, a, is a, a sort of a condition in which what one does because it is an obedience to God, is also God's own activity, if you will. I mean, that's what St. Paul is describing when he says the energy of God is being realized within you. And it's a way of knowing God within one's active life. Uh, and so it, there's a lot implied here, but it, it leads to a different sort of ecclesiastical formation, you might say. So, I mean, might it be said that in the West there's more of an externalization and in the East more of an internalization? of God? That, that, I think, is one way to put it. Um, I mean, what, one thing that happens in the West, you know, that people have noticed for a long time that was problematic was that once scholasticism developed as a, as a sort of an ongoing self-sustaining enterprise in the universities, scholastic theology, you had simultaneous to that mystics who were divorced from academic theology and sort of went their own path and were doing their own thing. Uh, and the two didn't have a lot to do with one another. I mean, you had some figures like Jean Gerson, for instance, who tried to, to meld the two, but it was, it was sort of oil and water because mysticism was about experiencing God. Scholasticism was sort of about talking about God. And they became separate enterprises. And, uh, and the East never divided them or separated them. So God in the West is sort of an object of study, whereas God in the East is something that you kind of commune with through your soul, your inner light, or something mm -hmm. along those. It's strange for a metaphor here, but yeah. something like that. Does this have uh, any relationship to the development of science in the West? Is uh, the notion that you investigate God uh, rather close to the notion that you investigate his nature too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that is true, and that's, that's a good point. Uh, it is striking, you know, that the Byzantines had access to all of ancient science. Uh, it was all written in their own language in Greek, but they did very little with it. Um, they were content to sort of repeat what had been learned from the ancients, and considered that, uh, that science, uh, sort of in that pagan mode, uh, had very little relevance to the spiritual life. 
and so it was of secondary value. Um, what happened in the West was because you did have a sort of a, an intellectual culture that grew up, became somewhat autonomous, and had its own pursuits um, uh, through the, the development of the university system, you know, which was an institution, but provided a home for all of this and provided people with a kind of a professional incentive to say something new, right, to, to make a name for themselves. Um, well, that filtered over into um, commentary on Aristotle, including Aristotle's scientific works. And pretty soon, uh, yeah, one of the best ways to make a name for yourself was to point out where Aristotle might be wrong or what, where there seems to be a self-contradiction. Uh, and so that became a flourishing enterprise, too. Uh, and that was already true in the 14th, 15th centuries. You know, and a lot that laid, did lay, lay a lot of the great groundwork for people like Galileo. Uh, historians have studied this, so the, the medieval origins of modern science, a lot of it arose out of uh, criticizing what they had inherited from the ancients in a way that the Byzantines didn't have the same sort of impetus or motive to try to do. Uh, so yeah, it had good consequences, you know, and, and maybe some also maybe not so good. Is there any commentary uh, in the East on the scientific side of Aristotle? There are some, but they're they're much more limited and more more just a matter of clarifying what the text says. Mm -hmm. They're not ad adventurous, and this is true across the board. You know, they commented on the logical works. You know, the, that was part of the normal educational curriculum mm -hmm. was to study Aristotle's logic, but um, they were pretty much content just to leave it where it was. Um, whereas in the West, people wanted to probe and to find something new. Um, and that was true, you know, if you go back to Abelard. Of course, this got, some, got him in trouble, right? Um, and, and could lead to uh, a lot of controversy, a lot of explosive, potentially dangerous ideas. But uh, in the long term, it also, you know, brought a lot of fruit. Too. Where, where did the, the Byzantine times take us? that would be interesting to modern thought. Didn't take us to science. Where did it take us that um, we could now usefully engage in? Well, I think if you go to any Orthodox church, uh, or even the relics of one like Hagia Sophia, you know, in Istanbul was, was the great cathedral, um, uh, you see icons, and you see a kind of a sacred space that was created, and, and, and is still, of course, orthodoxy is still a living faith. Um, and a lot of people are drawn to those icons, you know, who may not be orthodox, but they recognize there's something here that is, in some sense, sort of summoning me to uh, another kind of reality, another kind of being. Uh, that's a vague way to put it. Uh, Jean-Luc Marion who's a contemporary uh, French phenomenologist, uh, and he's Roman Catholic. But he has an interesting book. It's called God Without Being. And it's an attempt to sort of uh, get beyond scholastic ways of thinking. Uh, and his first, using phenomenology, and his first chapter is called, it's on the difference between an idol and an idol. Uh, and the way he puts it, I think, is helpful. He says an idol is something that we create in order to sort of focus and localize our own conception of the world in personified terms. Uh, you know, Neptune, the god of the sea. And one would go to Neptune before a sea voyage, offer sacrifice, make a prayer, and ask him to protect your voyage. That's a natural human activity. Uh, but what makes it an idol is that you're sort of locating the divine within a conceptual scheme that you've created, or, or we human beings have created, and calling it into your service. Saying, hey, Neptune, I've done this for you, now you do this for me. Um, an icon isn't like that. An icon doesn't um, sort of fit a niche within our existing conceptual scheme. It presents to us uh, another way of viewing reality, uh, you might say even another reality itself, that's not ours that's deliberately portrayed as something somewhat alien and different. Uh, and I, there's no attempt to, to make it historically realistic. The poses, the way the figures are portrayed are, are deliberately stylized. The eyes are always a little large, you know, the fingers are always a little long. Uh, and it's designed to sort of uh, 
uh, present to you the spiritual reality of what that person truly is. Uh, so, for instance, if, if it's portraying Christ on the cross at the crucifixion, you know, the historical reality would have been a man covered in blood with horrific agony on his face. Uh, in an icon, he's always portrayed as very serene, uh, almost in a, in a pose of blessing. And the sign above, it, above him, you know, which historically was uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and it was sort of an accusation, this is what he's being crucified for, he claimed to be the King of the Jews. Uh, it's changed deliberately to be King of Glory. Uh, in order to put before us that, that this is God uh, on the cross, if you will. And so an icon summons you to see reality in a different way uh, and to enter into that way of being. Um, and that, I think, is something that, you know, no matter what your faith, you can find value in it because our reality that we live in today in a modern technological society is so, so much... Uh, opposed to that, so much pulling us the other way to be absorbed in the nuciae of what's new, you know, what what's going on on Facebook right now, and what, and, and the icon is sort of summing you to, to contemplate uh, and to to ask yourself about reality itself. Um, so that's one thing. I think that this is sort of a deep vein of of, of mystical engagement with God. Mm -hmm. I mean, we think of Buddhism and maybe Hinduism to some degree uh, as being mystical, as not having the kind of theoretical structure that Christianity evolved for itself. Now, I gather while that theoretical structure is very evident in the history of Catholicism and Protestantism, there's also some of that in the East too, is there not? Mm -hmm. but, but, but you're suggesting that what is particularly special about the Eastern Christian heritage uh, is its mystical name. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, with a proviso, though, I mean, the word mystical itself um, has a history. And um, when, I, when we're, I'm using it here, I wouldn't want to imply, therefore, private, therefore, esoteric. Um, uh, the word mystikos in Greek um, was used in the ancient mystery religions. And it comes from the verb muain, which is to keep shut. And it, it was, uh, muain was what you did in regard to the mysteries into which you've been initiated, namely you kept them secret. Um, well, so mystikos came to mean initiatory, something that initiates you into uh, a higher form of reality and a more direct contact with the divine. And it was taken over in Christian literature and used to refer to baptism and to the Eucharist and the other sacraments, and to the liturgy, the act of corporate worship. All of those are mystical. Um, and the liturgy, the, the divine liturgy that's celebrated in Orthodox churches still uses the word that way. It's called uh, the mystical supper. Uh, but it, mystical there doesn't mean private and esoteric. It actually means here some a communal public shared act that nonetheless initiates us into a sort of communion with the divine. And the divine liturgy is conceived as a way of partaking in the, the worship of God around uh, God's throne in heaven, you know, the worship of the angels. The angels are there uh, as part of that body. And that's the sense in which it's mystical. Uh, in, in the West, the, that word, of course, uh, does become so, sort of more privatized for the very reason I was mentioning earlier that mysticism became separated from academic theology and did become something people pursued uh, sort of in isolation away from uh, the, the church as a communal body. Though it's sometimes used to mean any secret set of knowledge, like yeah. the mystery of a profession, you know, the mysteries yeah. of the goldsmiths. I think the, the, the term mystery plays mm -hmm. doesn't relate, doesn't signify uh, something spiritually mysterious. It signifies the fact that it was put on by various craft guilds who had mysteries. Yeah, I believe that's right. Well, that was that. Yeah, in the Middle Ages. Um, so I'm thinking primarily by the 17th century, at least. Uh, people talk about mystical theology as a separate branch of theology, separate from uh, biblical theology and then scholastic theology. There were sort of three branches that they would distinguish, um, and so that gave the word mystical a lot of overtones. You know, someone like William James, when he writes uh, 
varieties of religious experience. He'll use the word in this way. He defines what's mystical as what's private and extraordinary and really cannot be communicated or shared with another. Um, and that's not part of the original sense of the term. What were the theological questions that were grappled with in this spirit, but where there was actually a kind of effort to kind of reason them out uh, in the East that were distinct from those in Western Christianity? Well, uh, I mean, the East did have to come to terms with that concept of divine simplicity that, you know, Augustine had developed. Uh, it clearly, in some sense, it is true. God is simple. He's not a composite body, obviously. Doesn't have physical parts. Um, so if you, if you don't go the route that Augustine and the later scholastics did go of sort of developing this as a philosophical principle, how do you think about it, uh, and how do you conceive this idea of synergy I was mentioning, that we can partake in the divine energy? How is that possible if God is simple? So it did lead them to articulate a little more philosophically, well, what are we talking about here? They distinguish the uh, essence, the Greek word there is usia, uh, from the energy, energy. And the idea is that any essence will have some form of energy, some sort of active manifestation. And if that essence is a personal being, then that active manifestation is within its personal control, obviously. Uh, you and I have our own energy, our own energy, our own characteristic way of acting uh, as human beings. Well, what's different in the case of God is that that divine energia, because he is God, can enter into us and sort of vivify uh, and enlighten us and enable us to do things we wouldn't do otherwise. Um, but it remains God's at the same time that it becomes ours. So they did have to, you know, sort of articulate philosophically the concept of synergy. Um, and in the late Byzantine era, this, you know, they became aware eventually, 14th century, eventually they realized what the things in the West had developed very differently. And then, then it became an issue of dispute. You know, there were on there was an ongoing controversy in some in the Byzantine. Uh, era in the 14th, 15th centuries, did become followers of Aquinas. There were Byzantine Thomists who uh, entered into dispute with sort of the more traditional Orthodox thinkers. Uh, and those disputes were still ongoing at the fall of Constantinople. <laughs> so, um, you know, they, they became aware, it was kind of late, but they did become aware eventually that, uh, that this split had emerged and it was a problem in its own. One of the, um, the doctrinal disputes that le leads to the split is the, the filioque clause mm -hmm. in the creed, Nicene Creed. Yeah. And uh, the Latins, if I have this correct, uh, this means uh, what, what's the origin, so to speak, or the connection of the third person in the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to the other two. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the Latins, he proceeds from both. Mm -hmm. Whereas for the Eastern Orthodox, he proceeds from the Father. And I'm wondering if that had a relationship to the notion of simplicity. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, I think ultimately it does. Uh, what happened there, uh, the filioque clause, which means and from the Son, it's just the Latin word that was added to the creed, uh, was originally added in Spain in the 7th century uh, as a counter against Arianism, mm -hmm. because Arianism had survived in Spain longer than elsewhere. And it was a sort of a local edition uh, designed to underscore the divinity of the Son by saying, and the Holy Spirit also proceeds and from the Son as well as from the Father. You know, so ergo, the, the Son is clearly God. Um, and So everybody was clear that this was not in the original Nicene Creed. Yeah, right, there's no dispute about that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it got wrapped up in ecclesiastical politics. Because when the Byzantines became aware that people were saying this as an addition to the creed in the West, they protested. And uh, the Western Church then, this was in the, in the uh, 11th century, said, well, the Pope has the authority to add this to the creed if he, so see, if he sees fit. He's the vicar of Christ. And so it became an issue of papal authority, which the Byzantines had already rejected you know, on other grounds. And so that got wrapped up in it. I think it is true that later what happened uh, with people like Aquinas and other scholastics, they're trying to incorporate the filioque in their philosophical theology, 
uh, in a way that doesn't violate divine simplicity. And so what, what Aquinas says when he explicates the filioque, he says, and so the Spirit proceeds from the Father and from the Son as from one principle. At unio, at uno, uh, principio. And um, uh, that was, in his mind, an attempt to safeguard divine simplicity, to prevent a, a sort of a bifurcation uh, of this person with that person. But in the ears of the East, that really raised red flags because, oh, it sounds like, so now you're saying there's something in the Godhead other than the three persons. There's this one principle <laughs> that the Father and the Son have in common, but not the Spirit. Well, what is that? Um, and that became problematic. And, and to the East, it looks like an attempt to sort of, again, to rationalize uh, the mystery of the Trinity. Um, and now, you know, I, I, whether that's true or, or fair to the West, I don't know. I think it, it becomes very complex and very subtle. But no question that the filioque was a big part of the dispute uh, throughout the Middle Ages. So by the time that the Byzantine Empire is on its last legs, um, you can see it some sort of exchange going on, a sort of intellectual dialogue that's going on between the two mm -hmm. worlds of Christendom. Mm -hmm. um, what is the West learning from the East? If the East is picking up Western scholasticism and Aristotelianism, mm -hmm. uh, what is the and Thomism? What is the West learning from the East at that point? Yeah, well, that's an interesting story in its own right. And, uh, uh, the word, the answer in one word is Renaissance. <laughs> the Renaissance really uh, wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for that fertilization of the West and Italy, especially uh, by Byzantine Greek-speaking scholars, uh, who already, you know, before the fall of Constantinople, they were already actively in commercial ties with the West. Uh, there was a large delegation that went from Constantinople. Uh, to Florence in, in the 1430s for a, a council there that was going to try to reconcile the two churches. And they uh, uh, made quite a splash and quite an impression, and a lot of people, uh, Italians, became very interested in learning Greek. Uh, less so, they were less interested in Byzantine theology because, you know, they viewed the, the Byzantines as heretics. They, the, for, for them, uh, that issue of the papal supremacy was just uh, non-negotiable. Uh, so no works of, of Byzantine theology that I know of were translated, but uh, uh, ancient Greek philosophy that the Byzantines had kept and treasured over the years, that was of great interest. So the works of Plato, you know, which remarkably had never been translated during the Middle Ages, uh, were translated, I think, in the 1450s, if I remember, somewhere about the mid-15th century. Uh, works of Plotinus also uh, that was called the Hermetic Corpus, you know, work that includes a sort of a grab bag of, of theology with some astrology and other occult arts that supposedly were delivered by Hermes Trismegistus uh, uh, to the Egyptians, um, uh, were, were viewed actually by uh, Marsilio Ficino, you know, who was one of the great advocates of this during the Italian Renaissance, as equal in stature and authority to Plato and perhaps even to the Christian scriptures. He viewed it as almost a form of divine revelation. I thought to be the actual origins of those. Uh, uh, the Hermetic Corpus? Yeah. yeah. Well, scholars today would say, no, no, no. It's not that, you know, more like maybe the second century AD. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a product of, of the syncretism of the Hellenistic world. Uh, some Greek philosophy, maybe some Egyptian religion, mm -hmm. and some other things mm -hmm. that we mixed in there. Uh, but it went under cover as being much more ancient. Um, and it did a lot to fertilize the Renaissance, and you know, and, and some other works of ancient science uh, that had not previously been available. I think Archimedes was part of that. Uh, Lucretius, uh, Stephen Greenblatt, I'm sure you know, he wrote a, a book recently called *The Swerve*, that's about the recovery of Lucretius's poem uh, *De Rerum Natura* uh, as part of this movement, and what a shock that was. I thought that was recovered though from a Western source. Uh, that may be so well be true. Yeah, true. a single manuscript. That, that probably is correct. Mm -hmm. But however it was, it was recovered, and, you know, as part of this Renaissance humanism, and it had enormous impact. It's astounding that that could have been lost, that it all hinged on. The survival of one manuscript. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, and that, of course, is in Latin. 
So that didn't depend on the Byzantines. But I, the so, story of that manuscript, I don't know. I mean, with so many works we really owe to the Byzantines. Um, and so, you know, the Italians, to their credit, were eager for that and uh, made good use of it. And thank goodness they did, because uh, the Turks, not so much, you know, they were. <laughs> so it's, it's really thanks to that fertilization that a lot of that ancient learning has survived. There continued to be a Greek presence in Constantinople after it mm -hmm. became the capital of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, was much in the way of philosophy produced after the fall of the uh, East Roman Empire? No, uh, I mean, they were, it was very constricted. Uh, they weren't allowed to operate universities or, or theological academies, uh, weren't allowed to proselytize or to teach the faith in any open way. Um, I don't think they were allowed to operate a printing press. When they wanted to print a book, they had to sort of smuggle it to Venice somehow and get it printed there. It wasn't a printing press in, in Istanbul until the 18th century. Really? Yeah. Yeah, so it, it was, they were really kind of up against the wall mm -hmm. and uh, uh, didn't have leisure for much, much of the way of anything academic. Um, were the manuscripts preserved through that period? Uh, mostly in the monasteries. Mm -hmm. uh, Mount Athos is still a great source of ancient Christian manuscripts. And a lot of things were preserved there that were not, you know, not preserved anywhere else. Um, but they tended to be mostly, you know, uh, manuscripts of interest to monks, obviously. Mm -hmm. So tended to emphasize prayer, ascetic disciplines, and, you know, interpretation of scripture, those sorts of things. Um, so um, I'm sure that a lot was, that was in Constantinople was probably either carted off or destroyed. And that wasn't the first time, by the way. It, Let's remember Constantinople had been plundered earlier in 1204. Yeah. In 1204, right. And they carried off quite a bit at that time. Yes. Was that studied? <laughs> well, that's a good question. You know, where did those manuscripts go? Because there was not a lot of ability to read Greek in the West. Uh, Robert Grosstest, you know, was a famous scholastic. He was one who could. He translated a few works. But that would be worth looking into. Were many manuscripts taken? And if so, what was done with them? because uh, most people in the West would have had little use for this. When does Greek arrive as a subject of study in Western universities? Well, not till the 15th century. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, beginning in Italy, uh, in England, for instance, it wasn't until the uh, time of people like Thomas More, John Colette. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I think, would have been 1510s, 1520s. You know, they were advocating for the study of Greek Places like Oxford and Cambridge is something that had not been done before. So, and Erasmus uh, visited Moore. He was a great friend of Moore. Uh, and Erasmus, of course, did a lot to promote Greek. And That's interesting how quickly that spreads because at the Stratford School, where Shakespeare studied, he did encounter a curriculum that was partly in Greek. He yeah, learned some Greek there. Oh, right. It took it caught like mm -hmm. caught on quickly once it did. You know, Erasmus's edition of the New Testament. That's probably Reformation here. People wanting to go back to the original sources. Yeah. Yeah, they, they worked hand in hand. The humanist scholarship really did a lot to inspire the Reformation. Then once the Reformation was ongoing, you know, it it fed upon that scholarship um, and the attempt to sort of read the Bible critically, or at least without all these scholastic accumulations uh, of the Middle Ages. So we often thank the ancient Greeks for what they did laying the foundations of modern Western culture. But we also have a debt of thanks to the Byzantines as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, it was a pleasure talking to you. Mm -hmm.